I'm Carrie. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Episode 35. And we like to drive. <laughs> but we don't. Mm-mm. Let's just start with the most important thing ever. We met one of our creep family members. We sure did. Kimberly Kelly. We met her. And we met her. <laughs> <laughs> we met her and we murdered her. That's what I thought you were going to say. I was like, uh, but we didn't. <laughs> no, we met her twice because we had lunch with her. Mm-hmm. And then we saw her and went and had drinks with her after my favorite murder live show. Yes. Up in at the ATL, up in Hotlanta. Uh-huh. Y'all got me to freaking Hotlanta after all. But it wasn't hot. It was cold. I loved it. It was pretty. Mm-hmm. The leaves were gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, so we went and saw My Favorite Murder live, and it was amazing. Mind-blowing. The Fox Theater is beautiful. Gorgeous. The elevator is from the OG elevator from the 1920s. Yeah, because, of course, we took the elevator. I mean, Carbs and Cox, remember? (laughs) That's never going to get old. (laughs) No, because we both, we love them both. I mean, let's be honest. They're essential. (laughs) But, yeah, like, think about Rocky Horror Picture Show. That, that's what we were in when he's, like, anticipation. For what? The elevator? Yeah. Oh, I don't remember that. Oh, Lord. I mean, I remember that part, but I don't remember that part having anything to do with the elevator. Yes, he's in the elevator. Oh, God, I suck. Well, who knows? Y'all are going to probably be like, Donna, you're wrong, but I'm right. (laughs) Tally for Donna. I was just about to say, tally for Donna. (laughs) No, but it did look like, I was like, damn, am I in Tower of Terror? Yes. Because, like, even the little workers, like, looked like. <laughs> yeah, like the like bellhop. bellhop. Yes. yes. I was like, damn, am I been a Disney World ride? But it was fantastic. And they had the, the roof is, like, looks like a skyline. So it really opened it up. Yeah. It looked like if Aladdin was real. Mm-hmm. That's what it was. <gasps> yeah. Mm-hmm. It was like a dark blue sky. It mm-hmm, was just mm-hmm. beautiful. And they did have a little carpet mm-hmm. hanging on it. And little stars. Mm-hmm. And, of course, Georgia and Karen were on a first name basis. <laughs> In my head. They killed it. Oh, my always. gosh. Yes. But, of course, I like, Georgia was talking about her stuff, which we won't say because it'll be coming out soon. But Karen was like, I think I did a – crime to remember about this and then like she showed the picture and i was like well fuck i know this like i've actually watched this one yeah but she did do some updates that i didn't know yeah that was cool cool. yeah yeah they did a good job we have goals people we have goals Mm -hmm. it was what did we say five thousand people yes and you could hear it when they came out it was like a fucking rock concert yes it was a freaking amazing i was like carrie Like, goals right here Mm -hmm. to feel that. I mean, we feel love, but, like, just in in person, you know, to have that. Also, though, I might have fangirled more because at the end for the hometown murder, they were like, we have a fellow podcaster in Atlanta, fellow podcaster, true crime. I was like, pay Lindsay! Like, she went nuts. Like, legit. Legit. Went nuts. Carrie was like, you you screamed. <laughs> <laughs> so did everybody else, because that's yes. who they thought it was. I but think. it wasn't. No, it wasn't. But he was in the audience, and I was like, you motherfucker, where are you? <laughs> I had my cock radar on. <laughs> but I was blocked by carbs, and I was like, I'm hungry. <laughs> Detour. Yeah, it was good, though. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, honestly, the best part, meeting Kimberly Kelly. Even though she wanted me to walk... Five blocks and her lovely boyfriend, who is not Philip. <laughs> if you're on that live, you know what I'm talking about. But he was really nice. Mm-hmm. And I met a Canadian. I've never met a Canadian. Really? I don't think. Like in person. I know we have yeah. some. Yeah, no, no, no. I was just thinking. Canucks in our group. But damn. Hm. I mean, I was. I was like. Podunk came to town? Mm Mm-hmm. Country mouse in a big city. Which I don't understand. You lived in Houston for a year. Yeah, but we didn't take an Uber in Houston. I took an Uber here. Like, and our Uber guy was so awesome. On the way. On the way. On the the way back? The driver was terrible. Mm Mm-hmm. He wasn't good. 
Mm-mm. This guy, he was a jerk. Yeah. Actually, like, okay, so when we got when we got to his car, I like went to open the door and it was locked, and I was like, "What the?" I open, tried to open it like three <laughs> times, and then after I tried like three times, he cracked the window like half a centimeter. It was like, blah, blah, blah. I was like, what? And he was like, blah, blah, blah. I was like, what? And he was like, what's your name? And I was like, Carrie. And I got in and I was like, why are you whispering? <laughs> she literally said Well, because I was pissed. Like, okay, I totally understand. Like, locking the door, making sure the customer is who yeah. you are supposed to be picking up. Totally get that. But, like, I tried the door three times before he rolled the window down. Yeah. And also, we're two big girls. And it's like... Way past our bedtime. Yeah, 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what are we going to do? Like, seriously. Yeah, he was, like, he was obnoxious. Just feed me and tell me I'm pretty and I'm good. God, you'll get a tip. I did tip him, though. So, it was good. And we cannot wait till we get to meet more of y'all. hmm I know. I, like... I feel like meeting Kimberly was like the tip of the iceberg. Like, I cannot wait. So now we've, yes. we've met two listeners, Michelle and Kimberly. I know. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't wait to meet more of you. And we ate with both of them. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> we sure did. Yeah. Carbs and cocks. I mean, so next we have our carbs. <laughs> Where's our cocks at? <laughs> Calling all cocks. <laughs> Marco. <laughs> Polo. Oh, he'll have a polo stick. I mean, I would love to ride a disco stick. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. With that. You ready? Oh, I'm ready. Hit me with it. You go first. All right. Carrie and I have been on a shopping kick. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to do something that was, like, involved with shopping. And by shopping kick... She means Michaels and Joe Ann's. <laughs> we could sound cool if we just say shopping. I know. I had a dude today that, like, apparently was Gucci'd out. <laughs> and my coworker was like, oh, dang, dude, would you all you Gucci? And I was like, damn, I had no idea. But oh, my God. You, you give me a so Michaels uh, Christmas Village, and I'll be like, <laughs> oh, give me that uh, cookie house, that elf <laughs> shop you got there. <laughs> yeah, that's a good elf shop. Where'd you get that little? <laughs> True story. You snow so fluffy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fluffy. Priorities. Of course. Yeah, so we get those sales. Mm-hmm. 70% off. I mean, is it even a sale if it's not 70% off? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is a tale of a haunted object. Donna, you said you weren't going to do these anymore. But this one's not, this one's not like the other one. <laughs> The other ones, <laughs> you've done multiple, and they still fucking haunt us. But this one's not. Gonna haunt us? Better right. not. It's not. Satisfaction guaranteed after okay. this. Okay. Well, I'm gonna ask for the manager. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, this is... <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm just waiting for you to pull out a fucking Robert or a painting story again. Oh, no. But I can't even believe you said his name. I didn't say his whole name. <laughs> his middle and his last. The and all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. You're too much. All right. But I wrote this and I was like, I feel like I'm on the news doing a little teaser. Mm-hmm. But this is what I said. In this case, it will be something that you never thought would be dangerous. Is this a fucking elf on the shelf story? Your own bed. Oh. oh. Ooh. There's an elf on a shelf story? I don't know, but it's Christmas. I don't know. Damn. You know what's funny, though, is like from a kid's perspective, Mm -hmm. that really could be haunted. Oh, true. Yeah. You know, like, God, that's creepy if you think about it. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Sorry. I ruined your your bed. I know. Sorry. Okay. Does a mouse run under it? (laughs) Been there, done that. Got the droppings. Got the (laughs) crick in my neck from sleeping on the couch. (laughs) All right. Picture it. The Tallmans moved into their house on April 13th, 1986 in Horicon, Wisconsin. It was a small farming town of just 3,800. Considered super safe. You talk to strangers there. 
keep your door unlocked. You know, all that. The beginning to every scary story. Mm-hmm. Okay. Picturesque. That kind of thing. So the family consisted of Debbie and Alan and two of their children. Their names were changed for privacy. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's Kenny and sometimes it's Danny as a mm. son. Different articles. But we'll go with Kenny. Kenny was aged seven and Marianne, who was one at the time. And Debbie was pregnant with their second daughter. In February of 1987, the family's nine-month-long nightmare begins. It's a poltergeist-type haunting, Uh -uh. but some say it's bordered on demonic. Mm -mm. So Alan and Debbie, they are looking for a surprise for their kids. They found this wooden bunk bed at a secondhand shop for $100. So they went home happy with their purchase, super excited because they have this all planned out to surprise their kids with. They assembled the bed and stored it in their basement because, I mean, it's a surprise Mm -hmm. and they have a certain date that they're thinking about bringing it up. So no one else knows that it's downstairs in the basement. Mm Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, the children, who were rarely sick before, become ill for no apparent reason. Deborah and Alan started fighting over nothing. It was just like tension in the house. So Sarah, their second daughter, was born. But with that, Deborah became ill during her pregnancy and delivery. So she was put on bed rest So her mother and her sister came to help out because Alan worked late nights at a factory. So during the day, he just was sleeping. Yeah. Well, it soon turned out that they felt a heaviness in the house and they just had that eerie feeling and they didn't like staying there. But then Deborah's sister actually fell ill for no apparent reason. And it was only when she would visit. So when Sarah was seven months old, some said closer to a year, but again, different articles. Alan and Deborah moved her and her older sister, Marianne, into a room together. So they started sharing the bunk beds, obviously Sarah on bottom. Mm -hmm. So they took over Kenny's old room and he moved into the smaller room where Sarah was. Mm -hmm. Before. So that very night, the horror began. Kenny was about to go to bed. You know, they went through their whole night John boy, night Mm -hmm. blah, blah. Don't know the rest because I never watched that show. Did all that. Well, they close his door. He's getting cozy. And his clock radio apparently is just turned on and off by itself. Like multiple times. Then it would randomly switch channels. He said that he saw the radio's vindicator moving itself. And I think that's the, the dial, dial thing. thing. Okay, I was like, what the fuck? I don't know. I didn't look it up, but I mean, that's just what I'm thinking. Yeah. So he told his parents they didn't believe him because, you know, he's a kid. And of course, the spirit or whatever first terrorized them, mm-hmm. the kids, before the adults. Right. Shortly after, all of the kids started having terrible nightmares, and then Debbie started having them. And that was one of the aspects that really shook Debbie. She was quoted saying, I'd wake up all night crying, and I'd ask Alan if I was going to have these nightmares like this for the rest of my life. I would dream that my kids were dying, that Alan was dying, and that my father was dying. Mm. So, like, could you imagine? Blessed. Like, over and over. I mean, I've had those dreams where you wake up crying, and it's, Mm -hmm. like, so exhausting. Could you imagine having them all the time? And then could you imagine your kids having bad nightmares, too? So, So like, when you are sleeping, you're woken up by them having nightmares? A little while later, they purchased a kitten or adopted. I don't know. Wasn't there. But every day at sunset, the cat would start zooming across the living room. It would start climbing up the doors, like, going bonkers. 
So Alan shut the cat into the bathroom, trying to like, Mm -hmm. you know, compress it and be like, chill out, bro. Yeah. And it would start to howl. What? Which, you know, like, meow. But. Meow. (laughs) Yes. Know what cats do. (laughs) So one night after Alan let the cat out of the bag, just kidding, out of the bathroom. She she went bonkers again and, like, ran up the wall with her little claws and was hanging by the plaster on the wall. Oh, my God. In the living room and, like, meowing. So, she soon found another home. (gasps) I mean, I get it, but damn. Yeah. Apparitions were also seen. And both the children, Marianne and Kenny, referred to seeing an old haggard woman, but they called her a witch. When the youngest daughter, Sarah, was sleeping in the bunk bed, she claimed that she saw a red-eyed witch behind her door. Red-eyed? Uh-uh. Mm-hmm. She also claimed that she saw fire in her room. And a month later, Kenny saw the same thing. Kenny was quoted in a newspaper story that came out later, and he said that this is what he saw of the elderly lady. I saw an old lady standing in the door of my room, a little old lady, really ugly with long black hair and a glow about her like fire. Marianne saw this witch as well, the middle daughter, Mm -hmm. and she said it did hide behind her door, and she also mentioned how the figure was like fire. So by mid-1987, all the kids were having trouble sleeping. Debbie was having trouble sleeping. Alan was barely getting sleep because if mama ain't happy and the kids ain't happy and you got to work all the other times, like Mm -hmm. sleep deprivation. Which increases tension, which if it's Mm -hmm. a poltergeist is feeding off of. Yep. So the kids would wake up, go to their parents' room because then they would start to refuse to sleep by themselves. And by this time, Marianne had apparently gained an imaginary friend whom she would often talk to you. But then at a certain point, it started to turn into nightmares and it would scare her. So, like, it wasn't really a friend. It was a foe. Mm -hmm. But things were sporadic at this point where it would be peaceful for a week. And then something would happen. Again, peaceful. You know, so Mm -hmm. it was still in that something's weird, but I can't put my finger on it. Right. And I feel like if I was sleep deprived, I'd be like, it's because I don't have enough sleep. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing these things. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking this. Blah, 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 blah. Again, you always try to reason it away Mm -hmm. until you can't reason it anymore. Mm -hmm. Deborah began noticing things around the house, such as the garage door opening and closing by itself periodically. And one time... The basement window was removed from the inside, and it was placed on the floor. There was no signs of a home invasion other than that. No valuables were taken, and Alan had a lot of rifles down there and stuff, which would have been taken. Mm -hmm. To add to that, if anyone would have went into the basement to do that, they would have had to use a chair to get in and out of the window, but there was no furniture that was moved or anything like that. After that, Deborah became too scared to go to the basement by herself because, again, nothing is good about a basement. Demons and laundry. Mm -hmm. Don't want either. But with this, for security, they got a dog. He would start to go a little bonkers, too, but he didn't go up the wall. Right. So they were like... We need him for security. You know, he's alert. So they kept him, not like his little feline predecessor, they Mm -hmm. kept him. Some random fact is that there was a suitcase that would slide itself out from under a bed and then slide itself back in, like, periodically. Does it unpack itself? Because I'd be okay with that. (laughs) Right? Because my shit's still in my bag from Atlanta. Same. (laughs) Same. All I can think about, though, about the suitcase is, like, whack-a-mole, mm-hmm. you know? Or that alligator, alligator game. Alligator. I love the alligator one. But that's what I felt like. There we go. Gong. Yes. Gong. Oh, I love it. 
one night, Alan and Debbie were having a little date night. And it ended with a phone call from the babysitter because she claimed that her and Kenny witnessed a rocking chair move by itself while they were playing a game in the kitchen. So they came home, asked Kenny, and he confirmed it. The babysitter was like, peace out. Like, didn't sign up for a haunted house. Mm Mm-hmm. A few weeks later, Alan was painting the walls in the basement when he was like, all right, time for lunch, going upstairs. He placed the paintbrush on the table. When he returned, the brush was in the bucket with the bristles pointed up. Well, that jerk. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, a little bit after that, like, shit just kept happening. Right. Little stuff, but it's like, what the fuck? Yeah. Doors would bang open and shut. Strange voices would kind of call out of nowhere. And the ghostly visions of that old lady, the witch, would continue. So, they called their family pastor. His name was Wayne Dobrads. And he said he felt a presence of evil in the house. He said that he thought they were victim to the devil's evil. You know, it was work of the devil. He asked if any of them had played with a Ouija board or held a seance, which they said no. And then he was like, you might have been cursed. Because, I mean, logical. Mm -hmm. He said, y'all need to attend church religiously. See what I I did there? there. (laughs) I said, dot, 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 see what I did there? Damn. LOL. (laughs) Jesus, God. I'm my own hype person when I'm writing. Because they hadn't been going month, I mean, weekly before. Did he also say, and you must tithe 10% to my church? (laughs) Probably. He said for them to say prayers and play religious music in the house every day. He blessed the house, and that kept everything pretty much quiet for a little bit. However, a week before Christmas, Kenny saw the old woman again, and he saw her this time in the living room because he was too afraid to sleep in his own room anymore. So he was on the couch, and he saw her. So she's, you know, not just confined to their rooms. This is another place now. So he ran, got his mom up, and was like, "I, I can't stay here. Like, I want to leave. So, Debbie called Alan. Alan was super frustrated because, again, they thought they had, they were doing everything that the pastor had said. Mm -hmm. It was quiet, and now it's coming back even more. So, he said that he was to his limit. So, he was like, all right, like talking to the spirits. He said that... Quote, I was like a wild man. I was shouting at the top of my voice. I said, whatever is in our house, would you please leave my children alone? If you want to fight, fight me. And it listened. (gasps) Because three weeks later, around 2 a.m. on January 7th, 1988, Alan returned home from a late night shift. Outside the garage when he was, you know, parking his car, got out. He heard like an eerie howling sound. So he's like, what is that? And goes to investigate. Then a voice came out of the howling and said, come here. Come here. So he went around back to see if anyone was there because, again, he heard the voice. But there's no one. So he went back to the garage and saw that it was on fire. The garage? Mm-hmm. He was quoted saying that it was glowing inside the garage, an orange red. There were flames coming out of the overhead door. There were two eyes in the window. <gasps> Alan went inside to get a fire extinguisher. But when he came back out, the fire was gone. And no damage. No damage. Phew. Alan's like, okay. Again, it's late. Maybe he was tired. Yeah. Shit happens. It was a trick of the eye. hmm Whatever. He goes inside, and he goes to set the lunch bell he had down. Well, when he goes to set it down, something flung it through from his hands and threw it across the room. And he's like, 
That ain't right. I didn't do that. Yeah, like, some of them did that. Alan started sleeping on his daughter's floor, the floor in his daughter's room. Again, for a sense of protection Mm -hmm. for them. One night, a fog or a mist kind of rose up from the ground, from their floor. Alan said, I started to see this fog on the floor. A voice came out of it, and it says, You're dead. Then green eyes appeared right out of the fog, and he saw flames, and then it was gone. (gasps) So Deborah was like, Deep boop doop doop boop 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 to Wayne Dobrats again. She dialed the wrong number. Mm-hmm. That's what that sounded like. Oh, okay, because it's, it's supposed to go dee doop be doop 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 boop. Yeah. I don't know. I, I do it differently every time. <laughs> so he was like, I was right. It's evil up in here, and it is downright demonic. He's quoted as saying, I believe my initial analysis of the entity being in the spiritual realm, the occult realm, the demonic, if you will, was accurate, and I believe it's still accurate. Well, I'll be gosh darn, you're right. What did he do? He led them in prayer again, blessed the house, etc. Because that clearly worked the first time. Exactly. But I mean, he was right. Mm -hmm. He was right. A few days later, Alan was working late, and he asked a relative to go help Deborah with the kids. I think it was his nephew. Anyway, he was a complete skeptic, so he's like, yeah, sure. I got you. I'll go help. Whatever. Because by this time, they're on their wit's end. Mm -hmm. Or at their wit's end. Yeah. Whatever the saying is. I mean, are you online or are you in line? (laughs) Who knows? So he was in their room putting them to bed, and he saw the old witch. And he screamed, bloody murder. Um, So would I, buddy. Mm-hmm. Debbie heard him and was like, you know what? Get the kids, round them up, we, we outie. She called Alan and was like, we're not going back to the house. We packed our shit mm-hmm. and we're out. So they fled their home in the middle of the night in the dead of Wisconsin winter. Oh my gosh. You know what they need? They need a biddy from Ghosts in the Burbs. Yes. I need a biddy in my life and so do they. Yes. While it's unclear how the community first learned of the family's plight. Yeah. Hmm, look at you. I probably didn't use it in the right context. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote experiences, but plight, it sounds better. This is probably not right. We don't know how they found out because the Tallmans were not talking to the press. Mm -hmm. So, you know who was probably? The preacher. Oh, God, it probably was. He probably was standing in his pulpit one morning saying, I exercise (laughs) demons. So, yeah, I bet you're right. Damn do brats Mm -hmm. done spill the beans. Mm -hmm. Allegedly. So, because of all the rumors and gossip, the town was lit up with shit. You know, everyone was concerned, Mm -hmm. in quotation marks. So, the family met with the police chief, Douglas Glayman, Glaman, and after they talked, he was like, these people are sincere, I believe them, and I want to protect them. Well, in the absence of facts, because he's protecting them, not saying a lot either. Everyone's trying to keep it hush-hush. Well, when it's hush-hush, the media Mm -hmm. just sensationalizes it out the wazoo. Rumors began to spread. Media and hordes of people flocked to Larrabee Street, where they knew this happened, to see the house. But they didn't know the address. They just knew it was on Larrabee Street. One notable visitor was a drunk guy with a Bible intent on performing an exorcism. And it said, instead of casting out the devil and saving the town, as he bragged to police officers that he was going to do all this, he was arrested for disorderly conduct. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. With all of this hoopla, 
the story took on a life of its own and people said that there was there was blood oozing from the walls. Oh god. It was a hole to hell in the basement and <laughs> a snowblower that cleared the driveway by itself. <laughs> Damn, I need that. Just kidding. I don't have snow. But it's like, oh gosh. Yeah. Well, eventually Gleeman, Gleeman, the police chief, talked the Talmans into speaking with the press. Just this one guy, he's like, the, this is not a sensational thing. Right. He's going to set the record straight, and hopefully we get a hand on this. Right. And so they met with a journalist named James B. Nelson from Milwaukee Sentinel. They're like, all right, here's our, here's our story. But interest only continued to grow then. Right. And there began to be threats of arson to the house. Like, we're going to burn this down. We're going to get rid of all this shit. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. So the police chief eventually released the street address because he's like, I don't want you to burn down a house of a sleeping family. Right. And it's not this vacant house. Because it's vacant right now. Right. I found this, and I have to include it. In the April 1988 edition of The Quill, Barrett J. Brunsman wrote, Ghost rumors have swept through the crowd at a Friday night basketball game at the local high school. Hundreds of cars swept down Larrabee Street past the Tallman house. People walked through the yards of the other nine houses on the block, climbing over fences, peering into windows. Drunks showed up. They weren't afraid of no ghost. (laughs) They tried the doors and the windows of the Tallman house, intent on getting inside to prove their bravery. When the police ordered the drunks and the gawkers to stay away from the house, a few would-be ghostbusters told the cops to go to hell. Arrests for disorderly conduct were made, and the street was barricaded. So they literally had to barricade it off from... Could Traffic. You, could you imagine if you lived on that street, you would be like, fuck. Right? Later in April, after this was written, uh, in 1988, a family actually moved into the Tallman's house. And they had no haunting experiences. So, what happened to the bunk bed? Right? Because well, one how they know it was the bunk bed. I'm getting to Oh, you. okay, okay. I was like, what? I thought you were like... <laughs> done and i was like wait we're missing a piece (laughs) okay i'm sorry nelson the guy from the sentinel he wrote uh that the family told him they buried it in a private landfill in the horicon area where they felt no one was likely to build a house they didn't want to burn it because again we've all heard that if you burn shit like that The spirit's release or whatever. It can, you know, be worse. So they buried it in a landfill, whatever. The exact location remains unknown. Damn. Extra notes. The case was featured as a part of Unsolved Mysteries Halloween episode that aired October 26th, 1988. What? Mm Mm-hmm. And it said that... They had turned down lucrative tabloid offers and everything because they didn't want to make money off of their children's yeah. misfortune. They agreed to share their stories on Unsolved Mysteries under three conditions. They were censored during the interviews. Their children's names were to be protected by alias and that all reenactments of their experiences were done by actors playing them. So, they always thought it was the beds because everything happened after they assembled the beds in the basement. Then, when they moved them up, everything escalated into seeing apparitions and everything. So, we know objects, obviously, are capable of being haunted. Mm -hmm. We've talked about it. And on Unsolved Mysteries, what they were talking about was spiritual attachments With the bunk beds, it's hard to say because the parents don't know the backstory. They just bought it from a secondhand shop. But they were saying that what if some unspeakable act 
act was performed on oh, the bunk God, bed. I hope not. Which is terrible. Or, like, the child died violently mm, on it. Not. Something that would make that spirit attach to right. that. Or it said that that child could have been haunted who had the bunk beds. And it's possible that the ghost or the demon formed an attachment to that object where the child spent most of its day. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm just saying that's what they were saying. Word on the street was. Allegedly. Mm -hmm. The Tallman House activity was described in a book called Haunted America by Michael Norman and Beth Scott. But they didn't link it to the bunk beds. They linked it to the property being located on or near former Native American burial grounds. As soon as you said the property being on, I was like, Native yeah, American burial grounds. <laughs> yeah, who knows? I mean, it could have been all sorts of things. But if it was because of where the house was built, the family that came in after them would have had it too, and they didn't. Yeah. Or if it was poltergeist and it was just like a messed up family situation, which True. obviously we don't know, and people aren't going to be forthcoming right. of that. So we like we don't know. It could have been a perfect shit storm. Or it could have been with the bunk beds. This is still considered one of the most frightening and well-known paranormal cases of that Unsolved Mysteries series. Damn. Mm -hmm. And a little PSS. Did you always do that? Like if you mm -hmm. wrote stuff, I would be like, Actually, PS, PSS. I thought it was PPS. I don't know. I'm, I was probably wrong. PSS. No, I thought it was PS and then PPS because it's post script. And then it's post postscript, isn't I, it? I don't know. I was pro script script. Well, PSS in my world. World. Okay. <laughs> Others say that Debbie and Alan were just out of their depth with the house that they had just bought. And they made up the story to escape from the house and to not have to pay it off or whatever. Mm -hmm. However, it's not like they just stopped paying on this house. Like, they still had to do transactions to sell it, yeah. whatever. Well, they ended up giving it back to the agency and losing, like, $3,000 on the deal of equity and shit that they had in the house. So, they lost $3,000, but they're like, I don't fucking care. Take the house. Yeah, yeah, we're not doing it. Also, they turned down, again, that lucrative tabloid offer. It was $5,000 to tell their story to the National Enquirer. And they also turned down a chance to appear on Oprah. Damn. Yeah. So, they were all about trying to protect privacy, not have this right, not know, make sensational money off of it. Yeah. thing. So, again, why would they lie right. if they're not trying to write a book on it, have a series on it, you know, all right. of this shit? They have not experienced any other paranormal events since they moved out. And their children reportedly still can remember some shit that's happened. And they're still scarred for a minute. Yeah. The last quote I could find on the case is Deborah Tallman. And she said, I think it's going to be a long time before things get back to normal. I still cannot sit at home at night and not be afraid of the dark. Dang. Right? But also, so I thought about this because Carrie, we've had like a few weird things happen at Carrie's house. And I say it's because of a mirror that she bought. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be like, be careful what you buy secondhand. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know where it came from or yeah. what's attached to it. Nothing's attached to that mirror, though. You tell yourself that. Well, I liked that story. Yay. At least it's not something that's going to freaking haunt us. See, that's what I said. Like, it's a haunted object, but it's not a lingering scary one. Yeah. Besides, if you go, you know, antiquing and buy something that you think is harmless and something's not quite right. Which is what we do all the time. <laughs> yes. So, so I'm going to stick with my village and my spooky town. Go ahead with your bad self. Okay. The story that I'm doing this week, I, number one, had never heard of. Number two, a lot of the words are Spanish and I don't 
do well with that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so I would just like to preface this story that when I lived in Houston and, like, would try to speak Spanish to people and blah, 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 I would often get made fun of, of how I say stuff in Spanish with my Southern accent. And so when I speak Spanish now, I'm like, ugh. Like, I get so nervous because I know it's going to sound stupid with my accent. Yeah, me too. Ugh. Okay. So the story that I'm doing, there was not a lot of stuff on the internet about it. I basically got my whole story from this blog called ecperez.blogspot.com. <laughs> Sounds legit. I mean, look, <laughs> only credible sources here. <laughs> like, there really wasn't even... There wasn't a murder... <laughs> a murderpedia? There was. That's where I got this. <laughs> But even the Wikipedia page was, like, minuscule. And then all the other articles I found about it were itty-bitty and all said the same stuff that I got on Murderpedia. So. Yeah. And then the videos I tried to watch to figure out how to pronounce some of this shit was all in fucking Spanish. And I was like, <laughs> I heard the word loss. That's all. I, you know what I mean? Like, okay, is that what I need? You should have got Christy Weber to help you because she does all those novellas. Right? <laughs> I, know, I was at work. I was like, do you speak Spanish? Do you speak Spanish? Do you speak Spanish? What the hell you say this word? <laughs> so I'm doing the story of the sisters, also known as really hard words. Las Poquianches. Poquian, Poquianches. <laughs> We're going to call them little pokies. Yeah, because legit scoured the internet trying to figure out how the <laughs> fuck to say this and still got nothing. So there were four sisters. Delfina, Maria de Jesus, Carmen, and Maria Luisa Gonzalez Valenzuela. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) How I said it, I thought there was going to be more. Okay. So they were all born in poverty, basically. And their father, his name was Isidro, Isidro, (laughs) no, Torres. So he was like this, think Mexican mafia. Oh, shit. Yeah, he was abusive to them, very much like the rule with an iron fist, kind of what he says goes. Yeah. Kind of guy. <clears throat> and he was part of kind of what they call like a rural police, but not actually police. So not like vigilante, but also not like official. You know what I mean? Yeah, like a town, not town mob, but... Um, Kinda, yeah. God, again, here, Creep Mom would know. <laughs> yeah. So, what he would do with his little posse is they would ride through town and just kind of like make sure everything was okay. But again, he was very violent yeah. and would often abuse his power. Like I was saying, he was very, like, aggressive with his kids and they had to be proper and yeah yada 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 so when if the if the daughters because he there were four of them if they like wore makeup or what he considered risque clothing he would lock them up in the town town jail to teach him a lesson what as part of his like again his abusive power holy hannah yeah one time when he was doing his patrols he got into an argument with this guy and because he was such a na- an aggressive asshole, he shot the dude. Well, that's one way to make your point. I mean, you don't like what I'm saying? Boom. Go Last word. Mm-hmm. Mic drop. <laughs> Gun Glock drop. drop. <laughs> yeah. So after he shot the guy, he was so worried because he had like been gaining all these enemies yeah. because of his abusive power that he and his wife and the four girls... They ended up moving to Guanajuato in Mexico. Okay. So the Gonzalez Valenzuela sisters, like, because they had grown up impoverished and kind of in the, always in the sphere, they were like, look, we're growing up, but this is not going to be our lives. Yeah. And so what they decided to do was to, we're going to be entrepreneurs. We're going to open some businesses. All right. And so... Girl power. Mm Mm-hmm. So they pulled together their money. Not like (laughs) P-O-O-L. Not (laughs) P-U-L-L-E-D. 
But either could work either way. They pulled their money and decided to open a saloon. Picture, this is like late 1950s. Sorry, okay. I should have prefaced this. We're with you now. We're picturing it. Okay. Okay. So they opened this saloon in San Pancho. And so, like, they... That's the name or the city? The city. Okay. So the, the bar wasn't like... They weren't, like, rolling in the dough, but they were, like, comfortable enough that they had food. They had the necessities that they needed. Yeah. But they were like, okay, this is... You know, eating is all good and all, but how do we make more money? <laughs> we need dessert. We need... Carbs and cock. <laughs> so they were like, okay, how can we make more money? And then they were like, Drugs. sex work. Oh, okay. Well, and at this time, prostitution is what yes. they, you know. They ended up opening quite a few brothels in a lot of different areas that I cannot pronounce. Okay. <laughs> Nor am I going to even fucking try. Okay. But a lot. And how they got away with it was... They would bribe the local officials, like the police and all of that, with money and sex. And sex, yeah. And so that they would never, you know, they would never shut them down. Yeah. Got them by the balls. Mm Mm-hmm. Literally. Mm Mm-hmm. So Carmen, Delfina, and Maria de Jesus, who they also called Chewy, they operated their brothels in Guanajuato and another place. <laughs> <laughs> well, one out Jalisco. of two is not bad. Jalisco. That's what we're going to go with. And then the other sister, Maria Luisa, who also went by the name. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Eva the leggy one. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was proud of herself. <laughs> she ran the brothel near the Mexican border. So the sisters together bought a bar in... Lagos from a gay man whose nickname was, and so I don't know, I know this is in Spanish and I do not know if this is derogatory, just by the, by the by. Okay. But El, the El Pokinachi. <laughs> that so, sounds derogatory. Well, no, because that's the girl's names. Oh. So that's how they got their nicknames. So oh, they became, okay. oh, it is, they hated it, by the way. So it's probably derogatory. Oh, fuck. The Las Pokinachis. So I could be, this could be. Did I'm, you not look it up? I did look it up. I couldn't find anything. Well, we did more digging because Donna didn't believe me. <laughs> and I was pretty darn close with the, oh, we yeah. did find more of the pronunciation. And it is Pokianchis, but we do not have a fucking clue what that means. So again, please know that if that is offensive, if that is we're we're not gonna, I'm not going to say it anymore in this just in case that it is okay. But I, that's how they got the name then. Okay. And what I did find said that like on some asking type things like not Reddit but stuff like that where you like mm-hmm. ask stuff and get answered and, and people asked what does it translate to in English and some stuff said like there is no English translation. Well, shit. Yeah. The sisters would go out and about to try to find young women to be sex workers in their brothel. They would go out into the countryside, though, to find the women instead of, like, women who lived in the cities where their brothels were located so that they would find these young, kind of naive women who were looking for life in the big city and were, like, they were offered positions as waitresses or maids or other type of work that they were, like, okay, yeah, I can totally do that. You know, move to the city, kind of do my thing. Yeah. And then, you know, move up from there or whatever. Tell as old as time. Mm-hmm. The other way that they would get girls is they would use an army captain who was also Delfina's boyfriend. He would just go and kidnap the girls. Oh, well, there's that. Mm-hmm. Motherfucker. Mm-hmm. Around this time, their sister Carmen... This is like in the late 1950s. She passed away from cancer. Oh, gosh. The women who were forced to be sex workers. I mean, this was no. Right. I mean, this was bad. This Mm -hmm. was human trafficking, period. Yeah. What they would do is they would save the girls who were virgins and especially the, quote, prettiest virgins Mm -hmm. for the most wealthy patrons because they would pay... I mean, what we would say top dollar, but top peso for right. the, I mean, it is. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> for what they call, quote, untouched girls. Right. Which is, ugh, Gives me the heebie fucking jeebies. Like, what a fucking piece of scum. Mm-hmm. One, that you're taking something that's not yours anyway. And then that she's a virgin and you're so you're taking two things exactly. that's not yours. That you pay someone who, that's not their body. Mm-mm. Like, oh. Not their decision. Yeah. Oh, that gets me so I freaking know. I know. Nerd. And again, the police were in these women's back pocket. You know, yeah. like they were... They were paid off. They were the customers, too. Like, it wasn't yeah. just like, hey, here's some money. Look the other way. It's like, no, they were the ones coming into the yeah, brothels as well. Yeah, they were reaping the well. benefits. Absolutely. fucking lutely And so. They probably got a few untouched. Themselves. Their way. Exactly. And way, the ways in which they would make sure that the women did what they were supposed to do was they would immediately have them raped. They would, like, force them into these ice water showers, like, as part of what they call, like, an initiation. And then they would take all their possessions. And so the girls had to buy all their makeup and clothes from the sisters. Wow. So they would only be able to wear what they wanted to wear. They'd have to look the way they wanted them to look. Yeah. They had nothing that was theirs. No. Not even their body. No. Obviously, like, all the girls were held against their will. Mm -hmm. And then, by this time, Delfina had a son, Ramon Torres, or he went by El Tepo. He was also kind of, like, the muscle behind the operation that would, quote, keep the girls in line. Like, he Mm -hmm. would be the one that would kind of do some of the willing and dealing, but also torture the women. So, just for years, they made a fuck ton of money selling alcohol and women to different soldiers, councilmen, wow. police, and just men in the villages. Yeah. If a girl got pregnant. Oh, God. They would beat her and beat her in a way that it forced an abortion. Gosh. And then... If, like, the woman, so, like, if it wasn't early enough in the pregnancy where the pregnancy is kind of just, like, absorbed, Mm -hmm. if the woman has to have the baby, they would just dump the fetuses, like, in the backyards of the brothels or bury them at the sister's ranch. Oh, my gosh. And it said that, like, how the women were treated and how the fetuses were treated, it was... Similar to that of a concentration camp. That's so sad. I know. So, if, uh, in, of course, these women weren't taken care of. And so mm-hmm. what happens when you have women who are working all the time and malnourished and all of that, they get sick. And they're having unprotected sex with all of these men. So, yeah, they're going to get pregnant. Yes, yeah. they're going to get sexually transmitted infections, you know. And so if they got sick because of malnourishment or an STI or some sort of, you know, kind of what this article calls like an impromptu abortion. Yeah. Um, They would lock them in a room and literally starve them to death. Holy fuck. Or they would make the other girls beat them to death with sticks. Oh, my gosh. So could you imagine like this, you know, you are in pure hell lockdown with, I'm making up numbers, but 20 women. One of them, you've been with them for months on end, living in this torture. One of them gets sick because they're doing what they're being forced to do. So they get, let's say, syphilis, and they get sick. And so you are then forced to beat them to death. How do you eat? Like, you, I don't know. I cannot even imagine. Even imagine? Even (laughs) imagine. (laughs) Cannot even speak. Cannot even know words. They called Delfina's boyfriend the Black Eagle. So he and the girls, the sister's chauffeur, were the ones that would bury the bodies or would burn them or just, like, so they would, like, just bury them in individual graves. They would bury them in massive graves. They would, like I said, burn them. And then if they had men come in as patrons and they had a bunch of cash on them, they would kill them, too. Wow. And then steal the cash and then bury or burn their bodies. Wow. 
So this went on from like the early to mid 50s, 1950s. So in 1963, El Tepo, who was Delfina's son, he got into an argument with one of the police officers that was at the brothel. Oh shit. And he was shot dead. The the son. Oh. Well. Inside one of their brothels. Delfina is pissed. So the police closed the, closed the place down. And so Delfina is, like you said, completely fucking pissed. Not only was her son killed, he was killed in one of her brothels by a policeman that she was bribing. You know, like, yeah. she's like, fuck this guy. Right. So she got her boyfriend to go track the police officer down and then kill him. Wow. Like, immediately. Eye for an eye, I guess. Mm-hmm. Gosh. Yep. In early January of 1964, Catalina Ortega went to the police station in Leon, Guanajuato, and she was visibly shaken, freaking out, clearly had been abused and malnourished, and she told the police officers all about the brothel. Oh, shit. So, she had escaped... She had been told originally that she was going to the the brothel to be a waitress, like at a saloon, at a saloon. Yeah. And when she got there, she was forced through through human trafficking, you know, trafficking, forced to be a sex worker. And one of the articles I did read said that when she escaped, that she went home first. And told her mother what had happened. And then she and her mother went to the police station. So I don't, you know, the, a couple of articles kind of made it sound like she was by herself. I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. And I think she escaped through a window, too. Like, that's how she got out and just fucking ran for her life. Bless her. But she is incredibly lucky because she got one of the few police officers who was not wow. bought off yeah. by the women. So, wow. she's incredibly lucky. So, they believed her. And so, they went to file a complaint. They decided to get a search warrant. And they went to arrest Chewy, the sister, the Maria. Yeah. It's of the two. Not the leggy one, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> On January 14th, 1964. And then they raided their brothels. The sisters were still dressed in black. Like, the pictures that we'll, we're going to post on the show notes, like, the the sisters were still in all black in mourning for Delphina's son, who had died previously, uh-huh. like, that year before. And so, they, like, word had gotten out, and they had, like, taken the sisters through the town, and apparently all these angry villagers Mm -hmm. were out and were just like demanding that they be lynched immediately. Whoa. But it's like, okay, now you're pissed? Because you had to have known this whole time. Like you're fucking, you're kidding yourself if you don't know that there's all this corruption and all this bullshit going on. Like you fucking know. Well, it's probably most of the men that have been her customer and they're like, yeah, my wife can't know. So true. Boo, 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 boo. You know, condemn, condemn, condemn to hide your shit. So true, though. Because what's the saying? Don't the lady protest too much or something? Isn't that the saying for Hamlet or whatever? But it's probably not Hamlet. I don't fucking know. (laughs) I'm not smart like that. And But it's the same thing. Like, Mm -hmm. that's like Psych 101. The person who is like the most anti-whatever is probably because they're dealing with their own emotions of the same Exactly. Issue. When the police raided the, I'm going to call it a compound, for lack of a better word. Yeah. They raided their brothels as well as, like, their ranch and stuff. They found a dozen emaciated, dirty women all locked in a room that when they, and when they got there and they found all the women, that some of the women would, like, point to places in the dirt and say, the bodies. No. Oh, my gosh. The women's chauffeur was arrested, too. And the police made him dig in those spots. Yeah. So the motherfucker that buried the bodies Mm -hmm. also had to dig them up for the cops. Wow. Good for them. They found decomposing bodies slash bones of at least 91 women, 
men, and fetuses. Whoa. Whoa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So under, of course, like heavy military guard, because everybody was trying to, you know, kind of that mob mentality of like, yeah. lynch them, lynch them, you know, they were taken taken to jail. And remember, this was one of the Marias and Delfina. Mm-hmm. So about a week later, the other Maria went to Mexico City and turned herself in because she was so scared that she was going to be lynched because they, they were all connected. It was at their yeah. ranch, you know, like they were all going to get arrested. But she was so scared that she was going to be killed yeah. in the streets that she was like, okay, 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 I'll go in. <laughs> she went, though, because she also thought she was going to be, she was going to have immunity. But it kind of became like this, the, the trial of the century. And dozens of women that they had basically held hostage said that, like, accused the women of rape, murder, extortion, the... Media attention of this was, like, was huge. They even said that they were involved in Satanism, that they forced women to do sex acts on animals, and that they killed, tortured dozens of women, and obviously 91 at least, um, women, Johns, and then their fetuses when they wouldn't allow them to have the kids. I hate this for anyone, but when it's women doing crimes against women, I know, like this. Oh, I know. It's it's like a special. Yes. Fuck you. Well, the trial was chaotic and blah 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 blah, but it was pretty short. All three of the sisters were sentenced to forty years in prison. Wow. Delphina basically went mad while she was in jail. She was so obsessed with. Her fear of being murdered while she was in jail, that on October 17th, 1968, she was in her jail cell, freaking out, screaming, losing her mind, and some workers were doing some repairs above her cell in the jail, and they, like, looked down through the cell bars to, like, get a glimpse of her, because she's, like, this notorious killer. Yeah. And they're, like, trying, she's obviously losing her freaking mind and so they're like what's going on and they accidentally dropped a bucket of cement and it hit her on the head and killed her oh my gosh can you imagine that's final destination shit Mm -hmm. (laughs) um maria luisa the eva the the leggy one she died alone in her cell don't really know how or why but she died november 19th 1984 they found her body the next day, and it had already been eaten by rats. Ew. So you know that jail was nasty. Nasty. Maria de Jesus, she was the youngest. She was actually, like, served out her sentence and was released. Now, this is, like, a allegedly at the end. She met, like, a 64-year-old man when she was in prison, and then once they were both outside, they got married and lived a life, and she died of old age in the 90s. Wow. In 2002, this is kind of the end of it. In 2002, some workers were clearing some land for new housing development in Guanajuato, and they found, like this was just down the road from their ranch, they found the remains of about 20 skeletons in a pit. Holy shit. And they believe that those were also the victims. Those skeletons were either from the 50s or the 60s, which was right around their peak Mm -hmm. killing. It was down the road from their ranch. And so they believe that this is a like a mass grave or burial site from the women. And so if that truly is true, that raises the number of murders past 110 people. Whoa. The sisters hold the Guinness Book of World Records for the most prolific murder partnership. Wow. Yeah. Damn. And that's it. So that is the murderous trio. Well. No. Quattro. Quattro originally, but then that sister passed kind of in the middle of it all. So really trio of the Gonzalez Valenzuela sisters. Wow. And so the pictures of them are like. They look scary. And I think, too, for me, like, anytime there's a story of that type of mass corruption, everybody was in on it. So even if those women did escape, 
if they were caught by the, if, you know, the wrong police officer picked them up or they reported it to the wrong mm-hmm. person, they'd be dead. It's like Texas Chainsaw Massacre mm-hmm. when they go to the sheriff and the sheriff's in on it mm-hmm. and blah, 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 blah. It's like you can't, there's no safety. Mm-mm. You can't escape it. That is so scary. That is terrifying. Yeah. And so, like, there was really, again, every video I tried to watch on this was in Spanish. And so, there, I mean, I was fucked. But there was so little information that I could find on this. And it's like, holy crap, this is, like, the most prolific whatever I just said, you know? <laughs> And, yeah. like, they hold a world record, and there's, like, nothing on them, hardly. I mean, that was, like, the shortest story I've ever done. Yeah. And it's, like, potentially mm-hmm. over a 100 women and men and babies. Yeah. You know why? Because everyone was involved. So they don't want to keep it going because the more you know about it, the more people you know were involved. True. But it was so long ago. They're all dead now. Yeah, that's why you can't know. True story. Well, either way, I need more details. <laughs> well, get out your Ouija board. Well, no, thank you. But, I mean, it really does. It almost feels like womp womp about that story because there's just so little information. Like, No, that was a good one. Not that I want to know, like, all the gory details about how those poor women were treated and all that. But, yeah. like, I need more information. Like, I think I want to know more individual stories. You yeah. know, like, I want to yeah. know more about... I want to know more about the victims. I want to know more about the one who did escape, like how she escaped. What's her story? Can she write a book? Right. Like I want to know her childhood and how she ended up there. Was she yeah. kidnapped? Was she, you know, like that's the kind of stuff I mean. Yeah. I think it speaks to her, though, that she went home to her mom. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I feel like some people would be too, like, ashamed and mm-hmm. embarrassed to do that. Well, and especially what were the circumstances in which she left? Like, was yeah. it that she really was like, oh, my God, I get to move to the city. I've got a job. I'm going right. to be this amazing city girl that's independent, blah, blah, blah. Or was she like, I'm getting the fuck up out of here. Bye. Right. Or was she kidnapped? Like, there's so many different oh, scenarios yeah. in which, you know, she could have left. And so it's like. But it does speak that she volumes that she went home first. And I think even then, I think it helped that I think that even had she gone to a shady police officer, mm-hmm. the fact that she had someone with her being like, Mm-mm. yeah, it helped and made it more credible and made it more known. And it's like, you can't just get rid of this one. Right. In their eyes, just get rid of that one sex worker. Right. She doesn't matter. She does. I'm saying that that's what they would say. Yeah. You know, they can't just do that because, okay, well, she's got somebody with her. Right. She's somebody that loves her and someone that's supporting her. And, you know, Mm -hmm. crazy. All right. What did we learn? That I need to check my antiquing addiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You need to sage that mirror. Oh, my God. But seriously, it's so scary to think about that. You buy something, it's a mm-hmm. good deal, mm-hmm. and you're welcoming something into your house that can potentially kill you. No, thank you. Mm-mm. Or worse for you is interrupt your sleep. Uh-uh. <laughs> that, like, a uh, fuck you. <laughs> Do not touch my sleep. Yeah. Okay, number two. I feel like in my story... Delfina was the, like, kind of ringleader of everything. Mm-hmm. And she got got. Yes, because, she Because, like, like, so I guess number two is just, like, women on women crime. Any crime is fuck you. But women on women crime, to me, especially when it comes to rape and yes. torture like that, pisses me off. Right. And she got got. She got yes. what was coming to her. A uh, fuck you. Yep. Agreed. Like, we have to watch out for each other. Like, humans have to watch out for humans. I don't even want to say, yeah. like, women have to watch out for women. Like, we just have to be better people. Yes. Humans have to watch out for humans. But I'm just saying, with your story, women have to watch out for women. Because shit happens. Like, we are taught to look away. We're taught not to get into people's business. But if you see something... Say something, mm-hmm. you know, like if you're 
wherever at a party and you see someone who is clearly not able to stand up for themselves, at least say something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could even be you being a witness to that later. You know what I mean? Like if you saw something, you came back and were like, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. We, if something happened, we would be like, oh my God, that was this, this is who was there. At least, you know what I mean? Right. It's just there. I don't know. It's this. That was basically a story on Let's Not Meet that I listened to today. Number three, Spanish words are hard. I swear to God, I was thinking that. (laughs) I almost said. We need Rosetta Stone. For dummies. Yes. Spanish words are fucking hard, especially when you have a complex about your accent because people told you that you (laughs) sound stupid when you say Spanish words. It gives me anxiety. Yeah. Yeah, so people who used to make fun of me for my accent, let's not meet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I suck you. <laughs> uh, well, I was, but then I was like, no, that's, you know, that's Yeah, that is. <laughs> <laughs> Tally for Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, thank you so much for spending this, like, two hours with us. Mm-hmm. Remember to like, subscribe, blah, review, other things. <laughs> Hey, Other, how about have some gumption behind okay. that, Carrie? And don't forget to like, subscribe, review, and all the other things that you do on the internet. <laughs> the internet. <laughs> Look at porn. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you leave that open-ended? <laughs> Pertaining to us. Or whatever floats your boat. And remember, creep it real and don't get scared. scared.